This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yuat. It's Wednesday, March 24th. This is Africa 54. The deadly coronavirus continues to menace the world's populations. There are now over 420,000 cases of COVID-19 being reported across 196 countries, according to a Reuters report. Nearly 19,000 deaths are being linked to the virus. Italy reported over 5,000 infections in the last 24 hours, and its total infections are now almost 70,000. India tallied more than 500 cases for the first time Tuesday as the nation began a three-week lockdown. In South Africa, COVID-19 cases have exploded to over 700, according to Health Minister Zueli Mkize. Congo has imposed a state of emergency and closed the country's borders in an effort to contain the coronavirus pandemic. In Nigeria, Chief of Staff Abba Kiari has now contracted the disease. The United States now has the third highest number of cases worldwide after logging 11,000 cases in the past day. And with pressure mounting, top United States lawmakers reached a bipartisan agreement early Wednesday on massive $2 trillion economic rescue package to help workers and businesses cope with the coronavirus outbreak. A vote in the Senate is set to follow, and if approved, the measure will go to the House of Representatives and later to President Donald Trump's desk for his signature. Trump on Tuesday told Americans that he wants to open up the country by April 12th. VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara has more. As beaches begin to empty out after states such as Florida introduced sweeping regulations to try and stem the spread of the coronavirus, a signal from President Donald Trump that Americans need to get back to work soon. Speaking at a Fox News town hall, echoing right-wing commentators, Trump said he would love to have the country reopen its economy by Easter, April 12th. Our country is not supposed to be, you know, it's not, it's not built to shut down. Our people are full of vim and vigor and energy. They don't want to be locked into a, a house or an apartment or some space. They, it's not for our country. It, we're, not, we're not built that way. And I said, you know, I don't want the cure to be worse than the problem itself. The problem being obviously the problem. And, you know, you can destroy a country this way by closing it down. The White House is reportedly considering loosening restrictions, which may include allowing younger people to get back to work sooner. Public health experts have warned against prematurely doing so. The public health community and we infectious disease doctors are strongly in favor of social distancing. We know that it has worked in Wuhan, China. We know that it has worked along with extensive testing in South Korea. And we know when it wasn't done, it hasn't worked in Italy. So we're all very much in favor of maintaining social distancing and doing it in a very, very rigorous way. Trump and administration officials have argued federal guidelines for social distancing, including the closure of some businesses, could go too far and hurt the economy. Good public health also requires a good economy. And um, there's, each has its priorities. I, I get that. Uh, it's not either or. It is not either or. The, the, the two have to work together. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization has warned with the large acceleration of cases in the U.S., the country has the potential to become the new epicenter. Um, the WHO has also said that while uh, social distancing measures are um, important, they are alone not a strategy for managing this pandemic. And in particular, they have called for increased testing, of people who may be sick and uh, isolation of people who are sick, identifying contacts of people who uh, may have um, been around somebody who's sick and um, enabling those contacts to stay at home for a while until they know that they are not infected. Tuesday afternoon, key indexes at the New York Stock Exchange surged amid hopes for a Senate approval of a $2 trillion coronavirus stimulus deal. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. Music fans across the globe are mourning the death of a Cameroon-born saxophonist considered one of the most influential musicians in the world dance music. He died in France after contracting the coronavirus. VOA's Maria Madiello reports. 
86-year-old veteran Afro-jazz legend Manu Dubango died in Paris Tuesday after contracting the coronavirus. From his home in the Democratic Republic of Congo, fellow musician Kofi Olomide is shocked that Dubango is gone. It's a huge loss. It happened at the moment we were confined. I myself am confined because it's the only way to fight this enemy. Professor Andre Yoka Mudaba, director of the National Arts Institute in the DRC, says while Dibango is a lost musical treasure, he also had a force of personality. <laughs> Mano de Bango's symphonic laughter. He wouldn't say a sentence without bursting out laughing. He was a man at his age of an inalienable youth, unalterable and always positive. In an interview last year, de Bango reflected on an exceptional career of more than 60 years. I pinch myself in the morning and say to myself, I'm still alive. What am I up to today? <laughs> the problem is, what's on my schedule? Not, eh? Yesterday was great. Nostalgia. This is great too. But above all, there's the fact that everyone has their own karma and way of doing things. It's the sum of many good and bad things because the two obviously go together. A message on Dibango's official Facebook page says his funeral will be held in private, followed by a tribute when possible. Maria Madialo, VOA News. Congolese music legend Aulus Mabele also died in Paris of the coronavirus, according to his family and friends. It's understood the singer died on Thursday, shortly after being admitted in the hospital. The global coronavirus is affecting sports in a big way as leagues worldwide have postponed or canceled live competitions. Now the biggest event of them all, the Summer Olympics announced the Tokyo Games will be postponed to 2021. VOA's Arash Arbasadi has more. Tuesday in Fukushima, Japan. More than a thousand people gathered to see the Olympic flame, even though organizers tried to limit the crowd size to prevent the coronavirus from spreading. Meanwhile, in Tokyo, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe announced the postponement of the Summer Games. For the world's athletes to be able to compete in the best environment and for the Games to be safe for spectators, I asked the International Olympic Committee's president back if we could postpone the Games for a year. This will be only the fourth time in modern history that the Olympics have been cancelled or rescheduled. The other three were due to world wars. Abe described Japan and the IOC as being in lockstep for postponing the Games. President Back agreed 100 percent. We agreed to hold the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics by summer 2021 in its complete form so that it will be a sign that humanity has overcome the new coronavirus. No exact date for the 2021 Games has been announced. The postponement is likely to have an economic impact on Tokyo businesses from the thousands of canceled flights and hotel reservations. Arash Arbasadi. VOA News, Washington. New York City is now the epicenter of COVID-19 in the U.S. All non-essential businesses are closed and unnecessary gatherings of any size have been banned to enforce social distancing. As VOA's Carol Pearson reports, social distancing is one of the best tools the world has to contain the virus. Leading U.S. medical and health organizations, representing doctors, nurses, and hospitals, wrote an open letter to the American public, urging them to stay home. They said it was the key to slowing the spread of the coronavirus. This practice will keep people from touching surfaces many others have touched, some who may have had the virus on their hands. Bacteria are going to be everywhere, so if you don't wash your hands before eating or if you're touching any other surface that could be contaminated, you're likely to get sick. And there are certain things that can live for weeks on a surface such as a norovirus. 
So you really do have to try to keep your environment, especially where you're eating in the eating area, clean. The U.S. National Institutes of Health says the coronavirus can stay in the air for up to three hours and on surfaces anywhere from several hours to several days. So if you touch an elevator button, the handrail on stairs or an escalator or a door handle, you could get the virus on your hands. Uh, anything that's touched by hands is probably going to be contaminated. The vast majority of your illnesses are going to be from your own hands. So uh, hand washing properly with enough time, with enough soap, with enough lather, um, or hand sanitizer if that's all you have available, and making sure you do that before you touch your face or before you eat. Doctors suggest coughing into our elbows to block the virus's spread, but it's best to cough into a tissue and then throw it away. The virus seems to be spreading mostly in the community, at restaurants and gatherings, rather than in hospitals. That's why physical distancing, disinfecting surfaces and things you touch frequently, like a computer keyboard, washing your hands and not touching your eyes, nose and mouth will keep you and others safe. The health organizations say they want to help people recover from the coronavirus, but they want Americans to do their part to keep health professionals from getting sick too. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. Remaining calm while getting the seemingly never ending updates on the coronavirus is extremely difficult. Maxim Moskalkov talks to psychologists about fighting anxiety during this difficult time. It is hard to keep your distance from the constant TV coverage and worrying charts showing the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some people start panicking, anxiety levels rise. According to psychiatrist Mary Albert, panic is a natural human response to stress. I think it gets back to, as humans, what do we feel like we need for survival? So water goes you know, off the shelves, even though there's no water shortage. Um, you know, we don't really need five cases of water, and yet the stores are now limiting you to maybe one case or two cases. Psychologists add that it is extremely important to be discerning about where you get your news so you can be well informed. And it's also important to control your emotions and avoid panicking. And maybe even look at this as some opportunities. Is there an opportunity now that you're home more or you are can connect with relatives or friends that you haven't spoken with in a long time? So I think with every crisis, there are opportunities. Psychologist and scientist Vail Wright says we should not underestimate the power of routine. Schedules and routine help maintain calm and gives the feeling of normalcy many feel they lack. To prepare yourself mentally, um, you need to be doing things like engaging in self-care. It's really important to keep in, to go to bed at the same time every night, and wake up in the morning like if this was a regular work day. Don't treat this like a snow day. Still shower, get dressed, eat meals at the same time. Clinical psychologist Irina Meleksitian adds that the way a person responds to a crisis situation depends a lot on their psychological type. It will be harder for introverts who already have certain anxieties to live under constant stress. They feel especially isolated because they can't meet with the people they're used to relying upon. But thankfully, we have all this technology. We can call, we have Skype and FaceTime. It helps to keep communicating with loved ones, to show compassion, to demonstrate we care, and to know others care about us. In more severe cases of panic attacks, psychologists say breathing correctly can help reduce the stress and anxiety levels. Breathe in very slowly, then breathe out. Do it at least three times, and you'll notice anxiety will slowly go away. Try to stay positive. Try to stay calm. This is just something we all need to get through. Doctors and psychologists emphasize the importance of only reading reputable sources and talking to specialists. Knowledge and facts are the main tactics to fight uncertainty and anxiety, they say. Maxim Moskalkov for VOA News, Washington.
We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And we're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Still to come, Africa 54's Paul Ndiho reports on how young people in Ghana are turning the West African nation into a technology hub, helping to spur economic growth. We'll be back. to Africa 54, Britain has joined several other European countries in ordering the closure of all non-essential shops and services as the number of COVID-19 cases continues to soar. While big corporations may be able to absorb some of the impact, smaller businesses are threatened with an immediate loss of income. Henry Ridgewell reports from the southern British village of Ditchling. For five centuries, the Bull Pub in Ditchling, southern Britain, has offered a place to eat, drink and be merry. It has survived wars and revolutions. Now, in 2020, the coronavirus has closed its doors. People's trade, it fell off the edge of a cliff overnight. And for a place like us and many others that are consistently busy, it was terrifying. That was the biggest worry. We've got over 35 staff on the payroll here. Um, that's a huge lot of people to worry about. Many British businesses have already laid off staff. Raftery is determined to keep hers on. Our concern always has to be what happens afterwards as well. So initially, laying off all your staff, well, where does that leave you when this is all over in two or three months' time? You know, we couldn't operate back to normal capacity overnight if you lay your team off. Britain severely tightened restrictions Monday, ordering the closure of all non-essential shops and services. No Prime Minister wants to enact measures like this. I know the damage that this disruption is doing and will do to people's lives, to their businesses and to their jobs. Britain has pledged almost $400 billion in loans to help businesses. 80% of employees' wages will be paid by the state, up to $3,000 per month. Such unprecedented moves are being replicated across Europe. We're likely to see a significant economic shock from the demand side as consumers retrench. That is rippling out now, not only in airlines, but also in retailers, hotels, and pretty much across the entire services sector. At Britain's Heathrow Airport, the planes sit idle. Accountancy firm KPMG predicts the British economy will shrink by 2.6% this year, while Capital Economics warns of a possible 20% contraction over the next three years. Back in Ditchling, pub manager Molly Raftery says she's received heartwarming local support. Knowing that day in, day out, we're here and we're providing a service, uh, to suddenly have that taken away is a huge shock to a lot of people. We are confident that we can put in place the measures to be ready and fighting fit the minute this ban is lifted. For other businesses, the reality of the lockdown will likely mean bankruptcy. In the hills above Ditchling, the South Downs National Park, many local residents have sought escape from the crisis. When the post-coronavirus age dawns, it will likely reveal a very different economic landscape. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, Ditchling in southern Britain.
Sudan's Minister of Defense, Jamal El Din Omar, died of a heart attack on Wednesday in South Sudan's capital, Juba, where he was taking part in peace talks with rebel groups, according to the army. Omar was a member of the military council that took over after toppling veteran ruler Omar al-Bashir last year until a power-sharing deal between civilians and the military to run the country for three years. He took a leading role in peace talks that started in October to try to end a series of conflicts in Darfur, southern borderlands and other remote regions. Boko Haram militants killed 92 Chadian soldiers and wounded 47 more in the deadliest attack ever on the country's military. According to the country's president, Idris Deby, who spoke late Tuesday, the soldiers were attacked on Monday on the island village of Boma in the swampy Lake Chad zone in the west of the country, where the armies of Chad, Nigeria, and Niger have been fighting the Islamist militants for years. In neighboring Nigeria, around 70 soldiers were killed in an Islamist militant ambush in northeastern state of Borno, according to three military sources and a security source that spoke to Reuters on Tuesday. They said the attackers used rocket-propelled grenades and other heavy weaponry in the attack in the village of Goji on Monday evening. Injured soldiers were taken to the capital city of Maiduguri, while the bodies of the dead were taken to my Malari military hospital. To a brighter story. Young people in Ghana are creating new technologies and applications that are driving the country's economic growth and turning the nation into a technology hub. Africa 54's Paul Ndiho spoke with Josiah Kwesi Eyison, co founder and CEO of iSpace, an innovation and technology hub in Accra, Ghana. iSpace offers a co working space, training, access to funding, and helping entrepreneurs to launch their startups and access markets. The conversation was always around why don't we have a space for entrepreneurs to work from and because over here space is very expensive so you have to pay two or three years in advance. So we opened, uh, we launched the space and then launched the space in 2013 and um, it was just pretty much looking at providing um, a co-working space but then that kind of morphed into providing a training center and then now that's kind of grown into providing a basic funding for the startups that we work with. When you talk about startups, uh, for people who don't understand startups, what is a startup? It's a good question. So we've never been able to kind of um, define that, but from a basic or layman um, man's terms, it's just um, a company that has not figured out what its um, customers are at the moment. So basically they're using, they have a technology that they're working on. Um, so they're using that technology to solve a problem. And usually it's um, two co-founders, just two people that start um, the business, and it's not structured in the way a normal business is structured. You've talked about uh, how uh, you help a lot of uh, companies uh, start to uh, grow into uh, uh, bigger companies. Uh, how are you able to do that? Most of the people that approach us, they have an idea. So we walk them through the ideation stage, uh, which takes about three months to put together. Then they go to the development stage, which is actually building the MVP of the idea. And then from there, they go into an incubator stage where they put everything together. So then they go outside trying to find customers and everything. Mm. So in all, it'll probably take like a year for all of that to happen. So when we meet, first meet the people, they have an idea. We help them put the idea together. Then we develop the idea. Then we incubate them. Interesting. So you do even the registration for, for some of these businesses? Yes. yes, we do registration and then website domain purchase um, for them because some of them can't afford it. Mm. So that's part of the package that we offer them. Are there some uh, uh, startups that have started here or you've mentored some of the founders here and gone ahead to become big uh, uh, tech companies? So the people that we've worked with, um, like um, Hatwa Solutions, we work with individuals like PharmaLine, who is at the moment one of the biggest um, startups in, um, in Ghana. Um, and with them, we were able to get them funding. So they already had the idea, but we were able to get them funding for them to be able to launch. Who inspired you to start uh, this kind of uh, venture? So my inspiration, I think it's more Pan-Africanism. Um, so 
when you look at the likes of your Steve Bicos and um, you know the Sankara as well, we can do for Africa kind of thing. So for my, for me, it was those inspirations. So it didn't come from a technological point; it just came from a political point. How do people reach you? For our women programs, we intentionally put an ad out um, asking women that have ideas that want to build. So then they apply. We go to the um, uh, what they call it interview stage and from interview stage we're then able to then help them get into the program. Um, iSpace has always been grassroots so we then go to community centers as well and then kind of engage the community centers and tell people what it is that we do and then the byproduct of that you get people to sign up to some of our programs. Mm. Earlier you talked about how you help uh, some of, of uh, these uh, uh, startups with uh, funding. How do you do that? So um, what we do is we help them put the idea put the MVP together, build everything that they need to build, and then introduce them to potential investors. Uh, how did you get started? We started really by investing our own money into what it is that we want to do, and then eventually got partners that supported the vision. So. Mm. Are there some success stories that you can share? I mean, so with the success stories, you're looking at people that have been able to create jobs. Um, we're looking at programs like Unlocking Women in Technology programs where when we first started there was not any out and out programs that looked at bringing women into tech. So we did that and over, over the last three years we probably trained anywhere between 1,500 plus women and out of the 1,500 plus women I would say 500 of them, you know, are doing what it is that they're doing. Some That's of them just, impact um, right there. Huge. Yeah. And even if you narrow it down, over the three years, we've been able to get at least about 65 of them that have actually started up their business. When you're looking at success stories, we're looking at the impact that we've had by bringing in more women into tech, um, partnering with other hubs, which was never done before. So we were one of the first hubs that work with five hubs to then go regional with the program and after that we went to Nigeria, went to Kenya with this um, female program. And then when you look at our kids program that we do as well, Phoenix Kids, was one of the programs that then, um, I would say, kicked off the government's interest in coding. So then we work with the government on coding, well, taking coding to schools. So our impact has always been both from a social um, perspective mm -hmm. and also from a commercial perspective. That was Africa 54's Paul Ndiho talking with Josiah Kwesi Eyison, co-founder and CEO of iSpace, Innovation and Technology Hub in Accra, Ghana. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.